jacket will look funny on it. Hello everyone, my name is Richard McSherry, I'm the pastor of the Shaftesbury Methodist Church and we're joining you from the sanctuary of First Baptist Church in Bennington on the corner of Maine and Valentine in downtown Bennington and we're so glad to be here, come to you via Cat TV to worship, to listen to God's word, to sing his praises together. What a joyous time this really, truly, truly is. And um, as we do so, let's, um, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this day during this beautiful harvest season of the year to worship you, to praise your name, to encourage one another and support one another through sometimes very difficult times. And so we pray that your spirit, the comforter, will be with us. For we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, Chris is going to come forward at this time to bring our opening hymn of praise, and it's a, it's a great one for this time of year. Come, ye thankful people, come. A great harvest hymn. Come, ye thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, ere the winter storm begins. God, our maker, does provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come. Raise the song of harvest home. And so we've come to his temple, and we're going to raise our harvest song. Thank you. Home. 
At this time, we're going to have our, our Psalter reading, and it's going to be Psalm 65, and Sue is coming forward, and we're going to share that with you together at this time. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. To you who hear prayer, all flesh shall come because of their sins. When our transgressions prevailed over us, you forgave them. Blessed are those whom you chose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By dread deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. Who is the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who by your strength established the mountains being girded with might. Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at earth's farthest bounds are afraid at your signs. You make the morning and the evening resound with joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide its grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. The tracks of your chariot drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe, clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Well, indeed, uh, when we look around and we see the, the abundance of the harvest coming in and, uh, and we just pray the garners will be filled and that people's needs will be met, uh, we return thanks to the Lord and uh, we want to pray for those, um, especially those who are in want, even in times of abundance. So let's turn to God in prayer. We're going to bring our praises to him, our thanksgivings, and all of those things, but also we want to bring our concerns as well and we'll have a time in the service where I'll pause and I'll urge you there at home to just lift up your concerns and even if you're alone if you if you choose uh, verbalize those very prayers in, in, in God's presence because uh, if God is there and he is you're never alone so let's turn to him now gracious God we do thank you as we look around and we see that you have watered the earth you have nurtured the earth, you have prepared the earth, and grain has been sown, and, and now we're reaping the abundance. What a blessing it is. We do acknowledge, however, there are many who don't share in that abundance throughout our nation and our world, and we pray for them. We pray for, for, for their needs to be met and satisfied, and their lack to be fulfilled. Lord, you, uh, You've sent not only rains on the earth, but the rain of your Holy Spirit on our hearts so that it too may grow and flourish. Help us to grow, to flourish, and to serve you and to serve our neighbor. We want to pray for all of those who uh, may be ill in mind, body, or spirit. Be with them. There are many this past week who have lost loved ones, and we want to pray for them. Holy Spirit, just be with them. Comfort those people who have lost loved ones. Help them to, to rest in you at this time. We want to pray for our, our churches of our community, for all of those who seek to make the love of Jesus known to their neighbor. Bless them, Lord. Prosper their ministries so that others may know of that great love. Lord, we want to pray for this beautiful earth that will be good caretakers of this planet which you have given us. For we ask this through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, uh, Chris is coming forward once again to bring an additional hymn of praise. It only takes a 
spark to get a fire going and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love once you experienced it he spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on what a wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding the birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you're Bound. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. The reading from the Old Testament is from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. This is the word of the Lord that came to Joel. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. Your vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. The New Testament reading is from the second letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and then verse 16 through 18. 
As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, the day of his return, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the gospel reading is from the gospel according to Luke. Chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's uh, turn to God in prayer. Lord, we remember the words of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me to go into the house of the Lord. We're glad to be in God's house at this time. We remember the promise of scripture that says where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' name that you are in their midst. We are gathered here together through this medium of cat television to, to worship you, and we just thank you that you're with us. Open that word to us now, we pray. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be focusing on the theme of Thanksgiving in various forms. And we've done that already, and we're going to continue to do that. One of the things that is so important for the earth, for all life on this planet, in fact, including we human beings, is rain, water. In many parts of the world, there are periods known as a rainy season, uh, such as uh, India with its monsoon, or, or Japan has a, a, a few weeks, a couple of months in the summer when it's a rainy season, and even in the land of Israel, they have a rainy season. Beginning around this time of year in October, the rains come and grow stronger throughout the winter months in that land of Israel. Around March and April, the rains begin to dissipate, and the first rain of the season is called the early rain. And it's that rain that softens the ground, and farmers are able to plow the earth and plant seed and all of that sort of thing. Rain in the, uh, in the scriptures is seen as a sign of God's favor and blessing, especially in the Hebrew Old Testament. You know, we often use expressions like, don't let it rain on my parade. And we think of rain and gloom and this kind of thing as a negative. Not so in that part of the world. Rain is, is a blessing in that arid and desert climate of the Bible lands. The book of James, chapter 5, says, Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, 
being patient with it until it received the early and the late rains. So here too we have a, a spiritual analogy as it were regarding rain. And just as the earth needs rain for nourishment, we too need the nourishing rain of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives in order to thrive and to grow. We're reminded by one that the early and latter rain symbolize spiritual blessings from above which nourish and soften our hearts so that we may grow in Christ. We certainly need those blessings, don't we, each and every day. Spiritual blessings include the gift of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the scriptures. The early reign begins when our Lord and the apostles went out and preached the gospel to all the world in fulfillment of the Great Commission. These truths were like blessed rain pouring down from the dry land, parched and without God's truth. We are now in the days of the latter rains, a time of great increase of knowledge respecting the Bible and Bible events. God is waiting for that precious crop of wheat for the church to be complete. Joel is reminding his listeners that the God who blessed them in the past is going to bless them once again. Joel is reminding the people that God has poured down rain upon them before and he will do so in the latter rain as well. And these are the times when we reach back, all of us, you and me, in memory to those earlier times of God's blessing, maybe that, that first fresh outpouring of the Spirit when we came to Christ. We recall days and times and season and years when God's blessing was so abundant and we were so grateful. And as we remember, we smile and our hearts rejoice and we thank God for those times. We thank God for those blessings as we most certainly should. But that isn't the end. We're called to return thanks to God for all that he's done for us in our lives and in the lives of those around us, in the lives of those we love. We see his hand and his blessing and that gives us joy and peace. God has promised here in this reading from Joel a restoration for those lean times, those times of loss and devastation and what we might refer to as a spiritual drought. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper and the destroyer. God's promise, you see, is safe and secure, and the so-called locust years will not be lost forever. And what will be restored will be far and away better than anything we've known before. It will more than make up for whatever we are lacking now. What a glorious promise that is. Now, some of you may have seen a, a, a film or a movie, a historical or a, a na on the Nature Channel or something, about locusts. And we can see exactly the devastation that they bring to a, they strip a land bare. And after their arrival, not a sheath of grain remains standing. It's very devastating. One could be given to think that the land would never be produce again as we look out over the devastation in front of us. Well, what God is saying here is that he's going to restore those years. Those years are not the final end of the story. He'll restore the fields, the land will produce, and a produce abundantly. The granaries will be filled to overflowing and the people will experience abundance once again. An old saying has it, and this too shall pass. Joel is saying here that not only will it pass, but that which, is, which follows will more than make up for whatever went before. The thing is that you and I sometimes just, we just can't seem to wrap our minds, our finite, tiny little, more mortal minds around this. So often we get locked into the past and we allow that past to define who we are and what we do. We are unable to experience God's latter rains, as it were. God's latter blessings that he so wishes to pour on us. We tend to focus on what was lost, what has passed, what has gone on before. We mourn what might have been. We're trapped in the woulda, shouldas, and couldas of life. And this is a very difficult, challenging place to find oneself in. We get stuck and we find it difficult to move forward 
when we need to move forward, forward in faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith continues to push us to look forward, onward, and upward. Faith looks forward. Faith says, I can step out into the unknown as long as I do so with the Lord. Faith says, my past is not my future. And things may not only be brighter tomorrow, they may very well be better than I can even imagine. Faith says that the obstacles, barriers, and roadblocks, even our missteps and misdeeds of the past, cannot and will not define us and will not stop us from moving forward. My Lord, faith says, parted the Red Sea. My Lord stopped the mouths of lions, stilled the raging waters of the Galilee, even turned water into wine, healed the sick, and raised the dead. Therefore, you and I are not bound by the waves of the sea, or the beasts of the field, or illness, or even what has been called the final enemy, death. Because our Lord has conquered all of this. Hebrews 11 tells us, faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we don't see it. Being sure, knowing it's real, even if our eyes can't see it. The writer Max Lucado stated, faith is the belief that God is real, that God is good. It is a choice to believe that the one who made it all hasn't left it all and that he still sends light into the shadows and responds to gestures of faith. Faith is the belief that God will do what is right. God says that the more helpless our circumstances, the more likely our salvation. The greater your cares, the more genuine your prayers. The darker the room, the greater need for light. God's help is near and always available but it is only given to those who seek it. Faith tells us that those latter rains will come. We can trust the very one who made the promise in the first place. Jesus said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. Gracious, God's gracious invitation is there, but it's marked RSVP. You're called to respond. We have to answer the knock, lift the latch, open the door. Our difficulty is that we often are overwhelmed with a, a sense of fear and dread. We look at what's gone on before and what we may have lost, and then we look forward not in anticipation but with anxiety. But what does the scripture say? Perfect love casts out all fear. When we abide in Christ, his perfect love and peace and joy fill our hearts. When we abide in that perfect love, we need not fear anything, come what may. Someone has written, do not look forward in fear to the changes in life. Rather, look to them with the full hope that as they arise, God, whose very own you are, will lead you safely through everything. And when you can't stand it, God will carry you in his arms. Don't fear what might happen tomorrow. The same understanding Father who cares for you today will care for you then and each and every day in the future as well. God will either shield you from suffering or will give you the unfailing strength to bear it up. Be at peace. Put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginings. Indeed, we have to hold fast to God's hand in all those challenges and struggles. It is only that which will guide us through whatever may come. We can't do it alone, and that's the challenge. You know, so many people just think they're going to pull themselves up by their bootsteps and go forward. We, we do it in the Lord, and we do it together. Hebrews tells us, do not forsake the gathering together of the brethren. And so if we can, we should be physically present. With God's people, it's really a command. And we have this method of being with each other, too through this medium of television. Perhaps one of the greatest blessings we have is God shielding us from the future. Sometimes we think, oh, I just would love to know what's coming down the road. But if you really think about it, it's probably best we don't. If we knew ahead of time those challenges and difficulties that would ha face us, we might not be able to cope. 
The 19th century American author Harriet Beecher Stowe once said, when you get into a tight place and everything goes against you until it seems that you cannot hold on a minute longer, never give up then, for that's just the place and the time when that tide will change. Yes, indeed, the tide will change. The prophet Joel sees that day when the Spirit of God would be poured out on all people. Sons and daughters prophesying, elders dreaming dreams, and even the young being given visions. What a picture that is there in the Old Testament. This is the outpouring on all flesh that heralds the consummation of the ages before the great and terrible day of the Lord, as the Bible expresses it. And you know, we find this fulfilled in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts goes on to list the many, many different people from all corners of the world of that day who were blessed by this outpouring of Spirit. And it happened because they were together. They were together like, like he was reminded us. They, they, they gathered together with fellow believers. No matter where they were from, no matter what their station in life, God's blessing was powerfully manifested. It's often called the birthday of the church, that first day of Pentecost. Our problem is we get so weighed down with so many other petty things that in the long run really don't matter all that much. We allow ourselves to get upset by the trivia and the minutia of the everyday. It's not that we should ignore the everyday and our responsibilities. It's just that we should keep our eyes on the prize and on what is truly, ultimately, and eternally important. Colossians 3 says, if you are risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, the permanent things, the eternal things, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Seek what is above. As someone reminds us, don't spend your energy on things that generate worry and anxiety and anguish. And don't we do that sometimes? We fret and fume and what does this people say? Stew. But one thing is necessary. Lift up your spirit and love God. Before that outpouring of the spirit of Pentecost, the disciples were given instructions. The Lord always gives instructions where he doesn't throw us a curveball or have surprises. In Luke 24, we read, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. So they're called to gather together and to wait. And isn't waiting difficult? Well, the disciples were called upon to wait. Something we have difficulty with, don't we? We don't like to wait. Most people don't like to wait. And instead of resting and nesting, we fret and we fume. James 5, 7 says, be patient, always good if you're waiting, be patient, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop, be patient until it receives the early and the late rains. We were reminded of that. Just as the farmer has to wait, we too might be called to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One author shares, the early and latter rains symbolize spiritual blessings from above, which nourish and soften our hearts so that we may grow in Christ. Spiritual blessings include the gift of the Spirit and the truth of Scripture. The early rains begin when our Lord and his apostle went out to preach the gospel to the whole world. These truths were like rain, blessed rain that they needed, this renewal that they needed on the dry land of their dried hearts. They needed that. You see, these are the days of the latter rain. God is waiting for that precious crop for the church to be complete. Jesus said that the fields are white with harvest, but he needs the harvesters, harvesters who love God and love their neighbor and are filled with the Holy Spirit. James is encouraging those following Christ to live not selfishly, but for Christ. He does not want them to be impatient, but rather endure and wait patiently while Christ grows that church and the hearts of his followers mature in faith and love. Just as the farmer waits, so must we wait. 
In order for the Christian heart to mature, we need the Holy Spirit and the truth of the scriptures to help us grow. We always turn to the scriptures for whatever we do. The scripture is the final authority. These rains will water our hearts and minds so that we will grow and be fruitful in Christ. And to be fruitful, we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful to his word, faithful to his spirit, if we're going to grow. Remember, a better day is coming. The Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Isn't that great good news? There's a lot of weeping and loss these days, and our hearts go out to folks, but joy will come in the morning. We are called to remember the blessings we have already received from God's hand. You know, a little while ago, I had to go out of town, and, and I saw a bulletin board, and there was a, a church advertisement there on the bulletin board, and I liked its, I guess it's its mission statement or its motto. It says, we are a church of imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. We are a church of imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. Isn't that great? It really tells us where to keep our focus on the Lord, not on those around us. We're all flawed, but he isn't. There's an old saying, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It's as simple as that. We're just simply telling someone else where to find bread. We're all flawed, fallen, failing, and imperfect human beings. But the great, good, wonderful news is that God loves us with an everlasting love. And if God so loves us, and he does, how can we in turn not help loving others, respecting others, encouraging others, supporting one another? We need to ask ourselves, am I prone to praise or to condemn? Are we encouragers or discouragers? Do I find fault or do I lend a hand? As one 20th century pastor wrote, here is the key to happiness. Keep your heart free from hate, your mind from worry. Live simply, expect little, but give much. Scatter sunshine, forget self, think of others. Try this for a week. He challenges us, this author. Try us for a week and you will be surprised. It changes you, it changes me, that's the point. Sometimes we look to change everything out here, right? We need to change what's in here. We need you and I to think of others. We need to consider how our attitude impacts those around us. The same author goes on to say, so be strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. Make all of your friends feel that there is something special in them. Look at the sunny side of everything. Think only the best. Be as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. Forget the mistakes of the past. Press on to the greater achievements of the future. Give everyone a smile. Spend so much time improving yourself that you have no time for criticism of others. Be too big for worry and too noble for anger. What a difference the world would be if we took these words to heart. People need that kind of positive reinforcement, especially in this day and age. It has been said that courtesy of a small and trivial character are the ones which strike deepest in a grateful and appreciating heart. And really, if you know about it, any courtesy is never trivial at all, if it comes from a heart. Do you remember the parable that Sue read for us earlier? What was the response of the tax collector? He wouldn't even deign to raise his eyes to heaven. And he just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The absolutely perfect prayer, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what does Jesus say? I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his home justified rather than that other. Remember the proud man standing there? Oh, he, he knew his place in the world. For all who exalt himself, Jesus said, will be humble, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. We should always have that attitude of humility when we approach that throne of grace. 
and we know that the Lord accepts the penitent and welcomes us home and he doesn't leave us in that position that that penitent found himself in because following that is the restoration and the joy. The same Lord who went to the cross for us, the same Lord who rose again, the same Lord who poured out his Holy Spirit on us and poured it out in abundance. He is with us. That's the good news. That's the good news we share. The good news that will transform men and women, communities and nations, and indeed will transform you and me as well. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are merciful to us. We're thankful that you have poured out your Holy Spirit on us and we seek Holy Spirit to be in your presence more and more, to be empowered to be and to become the people you've called us to be. Amen. Well, at this time, uh, Chris is going to come forward to, uh, to close us out with our final hymn, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. just saying, sure as thy truth shall stand, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and the brighter bliss of heaven. Amen. Let's pray for God's blessing. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to join us uh, at uh, 127 Church Street at 10 o'clock at the Methodist Church, we'd love to meet you. You're always welcome. Let's pray for God's blessing. Gracious God, as we leave here today, as we as we go our separate ways, we pray that you will bless us and keep us ever close to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.